Okay, so the question I want to ask today is this. What is topology? Well, um, in a nutshell, topology is abstract analysis. So the question is, what is analysis and <clears throat> how does that abstract? Now, so analysis is concerned with, I would say, roughly speaking, um, continuity of maps, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, properties of particular kind of sets, all right? And so the, 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 the big question is, how do we generalize these, these ideas we know of analysis from the context of what's called Euclidean space, right, to an abstract context? So that's our larger goal, is to understand how to abstract analysis. Um, but before we get into that, we're just going to take a walk down memory lane, so to speak, and um, just look at what we know from regular uh, analysis on Euclidean space, all right? So let's, let's informally review analysis on RRN. So the key um, thing that makes RRN what's called Euclidean space is that the way we understand distance between points is with the distance formula, all right? Here it is. And um, so the, you know, the square root of the sums of the squares, the differences between the points, right? Or you can calculate the norm of the displacement vector from one point to the other, or you could take the square root of the dot product of the displacement vector with itself, right? These are the same formula, different ways of looking at it. But however you slice it, this is the distance between point X and Y. And as long as we, dis we calculate the distance between a point X and a point Y as this, um, R or Rn paired with this notion of distance, of course, this just collapses down to absolute value for R. Um, this notion of distance paired with this set is what we refer to as Euclidean space, all right? So how do you understand <clears throat> the ideas of topology in Euclidean space? I think we take it for granted, but it's been with us from pretty much the initial, um, certainly the start of calculus, but even before then, as we discuss graphs and pre-calculus, we're already thinking about ideas of topology. Um, so the way Minetti, and by the way, we're following Marco Minetti's excellent book um, on topology here. And roughly speaking, I'm in chapter one, although I've skipped some of his more interesting sections, you'll forgive me. Um, <clears throat> so he, he recasts the study of topology in the Euclidean space in terms of what he calls adherence. Um, he says this, a point X in Rn is adherent to a subset A of Rn if it's possible to find points of A that lie arbitrarily close to X. Um, another way to say it is a point X is like stuck to A. It's like literally sticking to A um, if, if it's adherent, all right? So here's the way to state that in terms of sort of like epsilon delta kind of notation. X adheres to A if and only if for any delta greater than zero there exists a point in A such that the distance from that point to X is less than delta, all right? So you have to be able to do that for any delta. It's got to be really close, okay? Now, a couple of examples here. First of all, here's just a subset of R2, right? And um, let me scooch this up here a bit. Subset of R2 and um, do, 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 do. this point X here is adherent to A because, of course, you can easily see that I can draw, here I'll draw it in, draw it in green, okay? Here, um, you know, is there any delta there exists a P in it? So, you know, you can envision all the points that are within delta of X like that. And clearly there's always going to be this part that overlaps with A. Over here, you know, if I take a delta, um, like a little ball around X uh, like this, you see there's always these points over here in A, so definitely X is stuck to A. Now over here, um, this is is not um, the point P, right? Does not adhere um, to the set A1, and the point P does not adhere to the set A2. See, because if I if I look at distance like this far from P, then only P is in there, right? And it's not stuck to A1. It's not stuck to A2. And if you put A1, P, and A2 together, it gives you the set A, which I would say is. Um, I wouldn't say this actually, but Minetti more or less says this kind of thing in his book. This is this is not a continuous set. Now, that's a sort of an antiquated um, language. We don't 
I don't think I've really anywhere except for this book read someone talk about continuity of a set, right? So we don't really talk about continuity of sets in the formal um, technical sense of topology anymore, but this word continuity is older than topology. Um, and so this idea of a set being continuous, it kind of makes sense. You can almost think of it as, you know, a subset of the number line is continuous if you could uh, sort of draw it with your, um, your marker without lifting the marker or something like that. But, um, you know, this is an informal section, so let me not get too carried away with all that. Now, so here's his definition of continuous mapping in terms of adherence. Here it is. Um, a function from subset of Rn to a subset of Rm, Euclidean spaces, a map f from x to x to y is called continuous if for any subset a of x and point x, uh, subset of x and element of x, which is adherent to a, well, in that case, the point f of x adheres to f of a. So here's an example of a function which is not continuous. Um, x over absolute value of x, you know. Here's the graph of this thing. And basically what's happening is if you... If you look at it, the set 0 to 1, not included, um, is certainly adhering to 0, right? 0, that point is stuck on the left end of this set 0, 1. Um, and the image of 0, 1, if you map, if you look at where does f of 0, 1 go, well, it goes to, goes to 1. Um, and uh, so, because 0 is not included, all right? 0, I'm saying, maps to minus 1. So f of 0 maps to minus 1, but f of 0, 1 maps to 1. So 1 does not adhere to minus 1. They're, they're, they're separated, you know. Um, so I just wanted to add an example to try to, you know, maybe bring that idea to life a little bit. But I really like the geometry of this definition, you know. And he talks about a function being continuous is one that doesn't tear, right? So the image, it's still together, right? You're not taking points which are stuck together before and then tearing them apart where they map to. Um, so it's, it's a very satisfying definition in that sense, but goodness gracious, um, I certainly am glad that's not my definition of continuity and analysis because it'd be a, kind of a pain to work with, honestly. Um, now, so then we go on to just down memory lane here to, to reiterate a list of things we know about continuous maps on Euclidean spaces. I'll try to be brief here, but x, y, z subsets of Euclidean space, you got a continuous function, um, then um, if w is a subset of x and z is a subset of y, then f from w to z is continuous. Now, um, see, typically, my typical notation is f restricted to w is the mapping from W um, to Y, all right? And I actually don't even have a notation for what happened, when you, so he's like, he's not only restricting the domain, he's also restricting the, um, the, uh, the co-domain here. So it's, it's a little bit more than what I typically call restriction, but I'm fine with it, I mean. He wants to call this restriction great. Um, it's a slightly looser language than the one I typically work with, but it certainly um, will avoid me some, um, you know, what's the word? Unnecessary talking. <laughs> um, anyway, so the next one here says the composite of continuous functions is continuous. The inclusion map is continuous. Um, if you've got a function from x to rn, then it's continuous only if and if and only if its component functions are continuous. All right, and then you can say more. You can say more than that. You can say every linear map is continuous. The multiplication map from R2 to R is continuous. The inversion map is continuous. Exponential, natural log, sine, cosine. All your favorite elementary functions are continuous on their domains. Um, absolute value. Um, the max min functions, these are all continuous. And, and these claims can all be established with the usual methods of, of analysis and um, in terms of distances, right? And epsilons and deltas and such. Um, and um, I've done that before in an advanced calculus course out of Edwards. It's called Edwards, uh, this is the author. Um, 
So if, you, if you're interested in that, if you sort back through my like advanced calculus YouTube, you can find that. Maybe I, I start to get bored with it later iterations of advanced calculus, but maybe like the first one I have posted, I did more of that. I don't know. Um, here's an example. So like once you know all this up here, you can use it to prove continuity of um, new functions from old. So if you have f and g continuous, sorry, I should be using my... So if you have f and g continuous, then um, this is continuous because the component functions are f and g. And then we said the sum and the product map are continuous. I'm going to call that add and multiply. And so like f plus g is the composition of the add function and this f comma g function, both of which are continuous. Composition, composition of continuous functions being continuous. There we go. The net thing is continuous. And then like likewise over here, multiply functions continuous and this function continuous. Composition of continuous functions is once more continuous. So, you know, once you have these things to play with, you can prove continuity of pretty much anything. All right. Now, the interesting question to ask as we go on in this course is, okay, great. All of these things can be proved for Euclidean spaces. Are these things that are unique to the context of the study of analysis in Euclidean space, or are in fact these general things that we expect to be true in arbitrary topological spaces? Now, certainly C4 isn't going to work for us in an arbitrary topological space, which could be something a little bit more esoteric. Like, there's not necessarily a way to break the image up into, like, components. Um, so maybe C4 is a little bit special in Euclidean space, but... I think if I had to guess that C1, C2, C3, these guys are going to continue to be meaningful in a more abstract context. Okay, but that's a, that's a future comment. We're not there yet. All right. So again, today we're just kind of looking at some basic um, things from Euclidean space and just trying to get a sense of what topology is about just a little bit. Um, next, Minetti talks about a subset being closed um, if it coincides with a set of points that adhere to the set. So closed points have all the points which are stuck to the set, you know? Um, so equivalently, C is closed in X if for any X in the complement of X by C, um, there exists a delta greater than zero such that the distance from, um, from X to Y is greater than delta for every y and c. Um, in other words, you can always like separate a point outside c from c by picking a sufficiently uh, well-chosen delta. Um, let's see here. And this is, by the way, not the standard definition of closed in topology. This is a, a preliminary thing just for this lecture, really. And, um, you know, when we hit chapter two, we'll get the proper definition of topology, and there we're going to get like clean, elegant definitions of open and close. So um, don't get too far into the weeds with this lecture. It's really just kind of a, a taste. We're really just trying to set the stage so we can understand what we're trying to abstract, right? Because the whole problem of topology is abstracting analysis. So it's a good it's a good pattern to begin with just a review of ordinary analysis, that is, analysis on Rn, on Euclidean space. So here's an example um, that's walking through, um, you know, thinking of closed sets in terms of adherence. Here's, here's a nice example. Um, if we have this set C, and what C is, is it's the intersection of the, the basically a ball of radius R, which is centered at X, all right? And then you're looking at all the points in that ball, which are also inside X. So it's like the intersection of a closed ball in the usual language and X. And the argument is with respect to this definition, that's a closed set. And so to see that, you just pick an element, a point which is outside the set, Z, all right? And you let delta equal to the distance from X to Z minus R, all right? But because of the setup here, the dist r plus delta is equal to the distance from x to z, right? I mean, that defines delta, but it's also kind of clear in the picture. And um, you can then notice that the distance from z to y, this guy, is greater than or equal to the distance from x to z 
minus the distance from y to x. Now that, that's not maybe not immediately obvious, but it becomes obvious if you just look at the triangle and apply the triangle inequality. You just take this and subtract um, x minus z to the other, excuse me, subtract the distance from y to x to the other side, and that gives you this. Um, so that then shows you that, hey, there's a delta which separates z from, z is not stuck to c, right? So um, z is not adherent to c, which is what we we're trying to prove in order to show that it's closed with this second sentence, this equivalently, we're just working through that, all right? So to reiterate, what example six shows is that a closed set um, intersected, excuse me, a closed ball intersected with a set is closed with respect to that set. Um, all right, I think later we'll recognize that this is still true if we um, look at something called the, the um, the relative topology, but anyway, getting too far ahead of myself here. Uh, another example seven is basically saying here that um, if you look at the level set, like f of x equal to zero, all such points, that's closed. Um, and also, if you were to look at like all of, if you look at x in the domain such that f of x fits inside some closed set, then that's also closed, right? There's also a gluing lemma. If we have two closed sets and X forms their union, um, and I think you you, um, you do need that. <laughs> you do need some condition on A and B. I think like they maybe they just intersected a point or something. Um, anyway, um, if you have if you have f from X to Y is a function. Uh, with f restricted to a and f restricted, restricted to b continuous, then f is continuous. Basically, if you have a function that's continuous on each piece you're defining it on, then when you stick those pieces together, you still have a continuous function. That's, that's the gluing lemma. That, that is still true in an abstract topological sense once you sort through the ideas. But it, well, anyway. Now, so shifting gears here a little bit, so one of the things, of course, like I've talked about already, the topology is concerned with is, um, you know, what's what do we mean by continuity, all right? The other thing, of course, we're concerned with is what's an open set, although I don't think that's clear yet from the examples today, all right? Um, I mean, we talked about continuous sets, quote unquote, sort of, but really this the focus shifts in, in topology proper to what, what what is an open set, all right? But then, a larger question is, um, when are two spaces, right, um, the same space with respect, with, in the sense of t topological investigation, all right? And I don't think we can understand that question yet, but in this lecture, we're just going to look at when are two spaces, um, subsets of Euclidean space, when are those um, the same? in view of topology, all right? When are they, when can you see one as the continuous image of the other and vice versa, all right? Um, if there's such a map, all right, it's called a homeomorphism. A homeomorphism is a continuous and bijective map that also has a continuous inverse. Two subsets of Rn are called homeomorphic. If there exists a homeomorphism mapping one of the subsets to the other, so if you've had linear algebra, this is a lot like isomorphism, except it's um, far less um, restrictive, okay? Like homeomorphism is just a bijection with con continuous inverse, like every linear map on a finite dimensional vector space, when everything is put in order, is continuous. But certainly not every continuous map is linear. Continuous is a much weaker uh, condition than linearity. Linearity is like you know, very, very strong condition. Um, so many, many sets um, are homeomorphic to one another, like any open set, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0 to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, these are all homeomorphic. And here's the homo homeomorphisms um, that do it for you. The exponential map maps the real line to the positive reals. Um, e to the minus x maps the, the uh, positive reals to 0, 1. If you think about it, 
this is all like pre-calculus graphing stuff, right? And um, if you're not comfortable with this notation yet, we'll talk about it more in a future lecture. Okay, I'm just going to not focus too much on that. The nuances of this notation just yet. I'm just going to use it, all right? Um, h of x uh, equal to 2x, that takes you from this set to that set. So h is the homeomorphism from 0, 1 to 0, 2. By the way, I wanted to warn you, um, the notation in Minetti is a little bit weird for us um, Americans. <laughs> so <laughs> in American education, almost always we use this notation. Um, this kind of notation you'll find in sort of more... Uh, circles that are more influenced by the French, let's say. Um, I mean, it is a nice notation. It does make a lot of sense, but it's just, it's too outside my, I, I will convert to uh, this notation if you guys don't mind. Another example of homeomorphism is, um, is you like, well, is everything homeomorphic to everything else? Well, no, it's not. So I, I would just caution you about that already, right? So homeomorphism is first a bijection. Remember one of the things we learned in like the foundations class was for two sets to be bijective, have a bijective correspondence, they have to have the same cardinality, right? So there you go. If, if two sets have different cardinality, they cannot be homeomorphic, all right? There's, there's one thing. Um, but, you know, some things might be homeomorphic that you wouldn't perhaps think. Um, one thing... Um, a circle is homeomorphic to a square, all right? Basically, the mapping is just to take the point P and map it out to the point S. That's the G map. Um, the inverse is just to sort of contract back, all right? So you just kind of look at any line radially and either go out or you go back in, and that's a one-to-one -one map. These points, these four points are fixed under this map, these maps and the inverses, but there's the formulas. And um, so, yeah, a circle is homeomorphic to a square, all right? And um, here's some, some notation for future reference. Yeah, you know, I was debating whether or not to do chapter one because chapter two is really where um, topology proper starts in this book, but I thought it would be a good use of our time uh, just to get acquainted and also just to sort of make sure we're not missing notational um, nuances of this book, because we, we want to understand the notation, right? Um, so, let's see here. On the flip side of things, don't get too bogged down on chapter one, because it's not rigorous, all right? It's a review, it's a, a taste of things, it's not really a complete discussion. Um, all right, so this is the closed unit ball, this is the unit n sphere, and this is the open ball centered at x with radius r. Um, when n equals to 2, I typically call this a closed disk of radius 1, or I'll just call it the unit disk, right? Um, and so, yeah, let's move on here. <clears throat> All right, so... Example 10... And a fine transformation is basically a uh, two by two matrix times the column vector x plus a plus a constant vector b, where the matrix is invertible. All right, so these are homeomorphisms, and like they'll take they take a triangle to a triangle, and and not just that. You can find given two triangles, you can find an affine transformation which maps one triangle to the other. So you know any two triangles are homeomorphic. All right. Um, if you had an n-sided shape, it's homeomorphic to another n-sided shape. Um, I'm pretty sure. Although you, you, you can't do, like, this would not be homeomorphic to that, I don't believe. Uh, you, so when I say two n-sided shapes, I mean, like, no, no pinching, no, you know, crossing or weird stuff. But it's not just the number of sides. Like, homeomorphism doesn't actually care about the number of sides. Maybe this example 9 was already a kind of a hint at that, right? Because... You know, how many, how many sides, how many, how many sides does the circle have? Some people would say infinity, some people would say one, but almost everyone agrees that the number of sides of the square is four. And certainly these are homeomorphic, but they don't have the same number of sides, do they? And so example 11 is a more concrete, less weird uh, version of that, which is that if you take this filled in square and the filled in triangle, 
And this mapping right here is actually a homeomorphism. So you can map the square to the triangle. Now here I'm this one I was talking about just the edge of the triangle, all right, or the edge of the edge of the pentagon or whatever. Here I'm actually talking about the shaded in square or the shaded in triangle. This defines a homeomorphism. Example 12, also very cool, still very geometric. Um, you have three sets. The punctured plane, which is just the plane with the origin removed. Um, people usually call this the right circular cylinder, the unit radius, you know, centered at the z-axis. Um, and then the one sheet hyperboloid, which you can define by this equation here, like that. Um, like you might see in a cooling tower of a nuclear reactor, for example. And, um, <clears throat> excuse my refrigerator. So here's the map. Um, that goes the homeomorphism from y to x. It's here you go. F of x y z is x e to the z y e to the z. And I was thinking about how to picture it. Basically, what it's doing is it's taking a circular cylinder, it's slicing it into circles, and it's just taking those circles and and sort of pasting them onto the plane. All right. And it either stretches or compresses by e to the z. E to the z is the radius of the image circle. And so what that means is like the lower half of this guy. With z less than zero, it maps inside the unit disk over here, and the upper half maps outside the the unit disk. The um, the circle the inner the circle of the cylinder, which is on the x y plane, is actually mapping to the unit circle over here under this map. So that's pretty neat, and this is continuous with a um, continuous inverse. And then this map down here is is a mapping from the one sheet hyperboloid to the circular cylinder, which is also a bijection. Um, and so if you've got a one-to-one -one map from here to here and one, -to -map, one map from here to here, I mean bijection from here to here and bijection from there to there, then you can likewise construct a bijection from here to here. Um, so these are all homeomorphic. And I don't know if you'd think that these were homeomorphic just at first glance, but, but, but they are. So, like I think if somebody asked me two months ago, hey, is a circular cylinder homeomorphic to the punctured plane? I might have been like, oof, I, I don't know, you know, but it is. And, and so is this guy, which is, I don't know, it's a little bit surprising. Um, okay. Then again, I am not a topologist, so, you know. All right. But I do know a little bit about topology, so I'll try to teach you guys. Let's see here. Um, so this mapping here um, is for r greater than zero and x and p points in Rn. This gives a homeomorphism of the unit, the open ball to centered at the origin of radius one, to the open ball centered at p with radius r. Basically, what this map is doing is like it's stretching it out by r, and then shifting it over by p. You know, translating it by p. So that gives you the homeomorphism between two open balls. So any two open balls in Rn are homeomorph homeomorphic by a mapping like this. And you can also define a homeomorphism from Rn to the unit ball like this. Um, basically, this just shrinks Rn down into B01 by keeping it in the same direction, but like making it closer to the origin, right? This makes everything go closer to the origin except for, for example, like when the, um, the length, uh, when you're one distance one from the origin, it shrinks you back to like distance one over root two from the origin. Um, this mapping maps zero to zero. So it's, it's just basically taking all of our end and just kind of sucking it down into the unit ball. And um, that process is reversible and continuous, so it's a homeomorphism. By the way, that will not constitute a proof later in this course, but it's a good enough for us right now. So, I mean, truth be told, once you've put all your uh, ducks in a row, so to speak, um, really the fact that the formula makes sense is sufficient proof that it's a continuous map. Um, by and large, that's kind of how things work, but we'll, we'll do a little bit better than that as we go on here in the abstract sense. Example 14 is the stereographic projection. Now he sets up the end sphere starting at zero with his coordinates and the north pole he makes the first thing. Now usually in other books I've read I'm looking at the, the 
um, like stereographing projection in R3 or something. And typically they make the North Pole the Z axis, not the X axis. It's a little weird, the formulas, relative to other books. But, you know, it's nice because it's, it's n-dimensionals. This is a very elegant formulation of it. And here you go. These are the, um, the function and the inverse function that maps you from the n-sphere with the North Pole removed. This is the punctured n-sphere um, to Rn. So if you take an n-sphere, remove a point, right? That's a subset of Rn plus 1 which is in one-to-one -one, uh, bijective continuous correspondence to Rn. So up to homeomorphism, up to topology, Rn and an n-sphere with a point removed are the same space. Um, example 15 is kind of kind of hard. Um, I just added a little of details here for you guys, but he looks, he looks at this, he calls it inversion, I think, and he says, um, well, it is its own inverse. He does, he, the way he says it, you might not recognize that, but that's what he's saying. It's its own inverse. If you take R of R of X, you get this, which gives you that, which gives you that, which then, lo and behold, you got the length of X squared over the length, the length of X to the fourth over the length of X to the fourth, so that cancels and leaves you, leaves you back X again. This calculation makes sense as long as the, uh, the norm of X is not equal to zero, which is the case provided you're on the space with the origin deleted, all right? And then he claims that the complement of a circle in R3 is homeomorphic to the complement of a line in a point, um, <laughs> which is it's just a very odd thing <laughs> to talk about, right? But um, I'm guessing that this example is probably important to a section later in the book, and like, so I'm talking about it a little bit, and we might need to come back to this example when we get to that section. I'll just say that, all right? Um, but it's... If you're having trouble understanding this example, I understand. I, I I think what he says makes sense, but, you know, it's hard for me to picture. Um, so moving on here. So example 16, I like. Um, so here it is. Um, SU2 is the special unitary matrices, um, two by two ones. And they satisfy this unitarity condition, which is that M dagger M equal to the identity matrix. Now, M dagger is the conjugate transpose, the Hermitian conjugate. The determinant is what it usually is. It has to be one. And if you sort through these conditions, all right, um, you know, make A, B, C, D your matrix, you work it out, you get these four equations, like so, all right. And um, so, that, so this gives you the length of A is a complex number squared plus the length of B is a complex number squared is equal to 1. And likewise for C and D. Go through a little algebra here, and then like take this equation, multiply by A, you get AA bar plus ADB bar. Now the AD you can solve for over here and get AD is equal to, uh, you know, 1 plus BC, so you plug that in there then that gives you this, but then that's, you factor out a a squared plus b squared here, length of a, modulus of a squared, modulus of b squared, factor out the c, that leaves you b bar over here, but this is one, so we get c is equal to minus b bar. And a similar algebra, which I won't show you, will show that d is equal to a bar. So when you put those back into your arbitrary matrix, you get a, b, minus b bar, a bar, like that. And so, that's the form of a special unitary matrix of a 2 by 2 size. And the neat thing then is if we define this function, f of a, b minus b bar, a bar, uh, equal to a1, a2, b1, b2, right? Where a1 and a2 and b1 and b2 are the real and imaginary components of a and b separately. These are complex numbers. Remember, they break up into two real numbers like so. Then what you got is a mapping from um, su2 comma c, like that, to this R4, right? But it's not just R4, it's R4 subject to the condition that the sum of the squares of the component squares is equal to 1. And um, you might recognize that that is what we call S3, it's the 3 sphere. Now, it, it, you may have lost track of things here, but um, you, you should you should be a little bit like, hey, wait a minute, flag on the play. You said we're talking about Euclidean spaces. Um, I recognize the, the, the co-domain here, the image, 
to be a subset of the Euclidean space, but um, this is a set of matrices. How is this a subset of Euclidean space? So like, eh, we haven't really done the work to show that, have we? <laughs> but but um, there is a, a way you can view SU2 comma C as a subset of a Euclidean space, which naturally identifies um, two by two complex matrices, you know, in terms of like, I mean, there are various ways to do it. One way you could do it is you got a two by two matrix, right? Complex matrix. That means you've got four complex numbers, which means that you have eight real numbers. So you could view C two by two, you can identify it with a particular subset of R8. And um, you could study a notion of distance on R8. And with respect to that sense of notion of distance, you could judge whether two matrices in SU2 were adherent. Um, and all of those things can be sorted through in a proper course of um, advanced analysis. And I do some of those things in my advanced calculus, um, but we'd have, to we have to define the norm for the matrix and other stuff. And like, you know, that's just kind of beside the point here. Just trust me, if you worked through all that, then this mapping is continuous from here to here in in a technical sense of whatever we mean by continuous from a set of matrices to a subset of Euclidean space, all right? But to be fair, we haven't carefully defined that yet, so really, you should say this example is out of order. Um, and this whole chapter is out of order a little bit, but that's the sense, it's a motivational chapter, right? Um, so, just wanted to wrap this up here. Uh, you know, he's got some great comments on page 16 here. Um, I think I told you a little bit of this already. Topological spaces are most certainly not all homeomorphic to each other, right? Um, for one thing, because they can have different cardinality, right? But another thing, um, like the whole real line is not homeomorphic to zero one. Um, that would vi violate Weierstrass's theorem on the existence of maximums for continuous maps, right? If you had a mapping from a bijection, a continuous map from 0, 1 to the reals, um, it couldn't be on to, right? Because a continuous mapping has to have a maximum, right? If its, if it's domain is 0, 1, it's continuous, it has to have a maximum. But is there a maximum for R? There's not, right? So 0, 1 can't be homeomorphic to R because of Weierstrass's theorem. Um, and uh, so anyway, this you know this exam this whole uh, sections, I mean, it's beautiful, um, beautiful examples. But um, really, just to try to give us a taste. And so when we my next lecture, we'll we'll move on to chapter two. Like the next lecture is going to be about what are sets and properties of sets. All right. And um, anyway, I, this probably doesn't help you with your first homework at all. My my apologies for that, but. Um, I think your first homework is really primarily based on section 2.1 um, or things like that. Um, so I hope you have a copy of Minetti. If, if you also have a copy of Moncrees, it's good for you. You know, Moncrees has tons of stuff also. But anyway, I'm going to stop here for now. Hopefully I'll have another video up tomorrow. So thanks, guys.